have to do it the new fashion way, Skype. Hello? Hey, Mr. J of J's Reviews. Now what do you want, Sidequest Gamer? I'm planning on doing a PS2 console review and I need your help with it because... You need footage. Yeah, sounds about right. And the only way to get me to get you footage is to have me collaborate with you since I could use the advertising. <laughs> or you can just get me the footage and we can not collaborate, but collaboration sounds nice. I'm in Aruba, Alec. I just got done with my 30 minute long slide 2 review that, you know, took 4 hours to render. And I've already played that game like 4 times in the last month. And I don't want to play it again, so maybe sometime soon. Come on, just one more time for me. Fine, if you title the video, PlayStation 2 Review featuring Jay. Dang it, knew there was a catch. Very well then, two content creators for the price of one. I get all the fans, and the ad revenue. What could be better than that? And I get nothing. You're in Aruba, what more would you possibly want? PlayStation 2. This console's legacy is pretty self-explanatory, but for the sake of the review, I'll talk about this console's legacy anyways. The PlayStation 2 was announced by Sony in 1999 as a competitor to the Sega Dreamcast. It was later released in Japan in March of 2000 and then released in North America and Europe in October of that same year. And because of the success of the original PlayStation, the PlayStation 2 made $250 million on its first day from sales because everybody was lined up trying to get their hands on the new PlayStation 2. And from what I've read around the internet, apparently there were console shortages upon release because the demand was so high, but manufacturing delays happened, therefore having the supply not meeting the demand. This honestly doesn't surprise me one bit, because I remember in 2006 when the PlayStation 3 came out, all the Toys R Us stores in my area had a sign reading, Sorry, we're out of stock with the PlayStation 3 consoles. And history does tend to repeat itself. I mean, who wouldn't want the next best thing? Who wouldn't want a more advanced than their current PlayStation? I know I wouldn't. I want to experience new hardware. I want to experience the new games that come out for it. The PlayStation launch was extremely successful because the Microsoft, Xbox, and Nintendo GameCube didn't release until later 2001. For a while, the only competition the PS2 had was the Sega Dreamcast, and we all know how that story ended. Sadly for Dreamcast owners, all the kids wanted a PS2, and all the kids had a PS2 in their households. The Sega Dreamcast was later discontinued in 2001, and was the end of Sega's console career, leaving Sony unopposed for several months until the Xbox and GameCube came out. The PlayStation 2 ran for 13 years, making it one of the longest lifespans for a console, Launching in the year of 2000 and being discontinued in early 2013 worldwide, it sold 155 million units worldwide, more than any console as of writing. The best selling games for it were Grand Theft Auto, San Andreas, and Vice City. Despite not many new games being made for it past like 2009, people were buying the PlayStation 2's dirt cheap. They were like $100 at that time, which is a great deal for a console if you ask me. It's kind of like the current PlayStation 3. Despite the PlayStation 4 being out, PlayStation 3s are being sold very cheaply, and people are using the opportunity to buy that now. Despite the PlayStation 3 being discontinued in New Zealand and other countries, it's yet to be discontinued worldwide. The PS2 being able to play 6th generation games was not the only selling point. No, the PS2 also served as a DVD player, and there was even a PS2 remote control to enhance the viewing experience. But personally, I always used the controller and didn't watch too many DVDs on the PS2 because, well, I already had a normal DVD player, but I could see why that was a selling point. In terms of hardware and technical specs, it depends on the version we're talking about. Yes, like the 3DS and Game Boy Advance, there are several revisions of the PS2 with some minor to somewhat major changes. 
the SCPH-10000, 15000, and 18000 models were only available in Japan with the first two not even having a DVD reader. There are so many revisions in Japan that it's not even funny. There's at least 14 different revisions of the PS2 between North America, Europe, and Japan. Although, for most of them, you wouldn't tell much of a difference. The PS2 America got at launch was a SCPH-30000, which we know as the FAT model, which included an expansion bay for what I believe is a PlayStation 2 hard drive, see if the memory card wasn't enough for you. In 2004, the most significant revision was the SCPH-700XX, aka the Slim model, which has pretty much everything except the expansion bay, and in my opinion was way too slim. I had one from 2006 to 2007 when it was cheap, but one month after the 12 months warranty expired, the darn thing overheated and could no longer play video games, DVDs, nothing. It couldn't do anything, it just started up to a black screen, and believe me, we tried replacing the AV cables, but that's when we found out it wasn't the AV cables, no, it was the console. That was my first PS2, and I was really angry. It's not like I left the thing on overnight or anything. Most of my gaming sessions were 5 hours long during the weekends only. I never played video games during a school night at that time, so if I do the math correctly, the PlayStation could only handle 400 hours of gameplay before kicking the bucket. That is unacceptable when that's only like less than a year's worth of content. My Nintendo 64 had over 1,000 hours clocked into it, plus many more hours from the previous owners, since the Nintendo 64 was a hand-me-down from one of my father's friends. The Nintendo 64 was released in 1996, and guess what? I can still play the Nintendo 64 to this day, 20 years later. So I do not recommend the PlayStation 2 Slim model. After that, we got the Big Fat model that has a much longer lifespan, we're talking 5 years, until the laser got weak and rather than fix the laser, we just bought another used fat model for $35. But back to the technical specs, the PlayStation 2 models, both old and new unless otherwise specified, has an Emotion Engine CPU that ran around 295MHz for the launch models and around 300MHz for the newer slim models. Both CPUs have 128-bit SIMD capability, so if you're wondering why so many PS2 games, especially open world sandbox games, run well to this day, you can thank the power of the CPU for that. The graphics card of the PlayStation 2 is a 147MHz graphics synthesizer card, and as for storage, the memory cards sold at the time were 8MB, which may be embarrassingly small when compared to today's data storage capabilities. It was enough to hold my entire childhood. Although it was quite limited, as when I wanted to play Jack 2 and Jack 3, they were open world games that took up a lot of memory on the PS2, and I had to delete a few game files just to make room for it. Luckily, there are now third party companies that will make custom 32 megabyte memory cards for the PS2, even though the console was discontinued. As for the display, the original PS2 came with composite cables upon launch because most people had CRTVs at the time. Keep in mind, this was 2000. Flat screens were available, but not for everyone, because everyone is not going to go out of their way just to buy a new TV for this console, so if you want progressive scan for your flat screen, as well as games that offered it, you would need to buy a component cable separately for that. I don't have much of an opinion, as I always play the game with composite cables, but from what YouTube videos I've seen with the component cables and progressive scan, it makes video games look so much better than what composite video offered. Progressive scan and widescreen with the PS2 was quite rare. I mean, what component cables do for PS2 is just make the picture clearer than composite cables anyway. And Alec, I believe you're really missing out only using composite. I mean, the PS2 component cables are really cheap, and I record all this footage with components, so I can say firsthand that's a huge step up from composite. Some PlayStations, including mine, had an Ethernet port for broadband online multiplayer because this was a generation that introduced console multiplayer online. Sure, it was popular with PC games, but this was new for consoles. I wish I could comment on that aspect, but the servers are down for all PS2 games, and I no longer have broadband internet. But from what my friends told me, Ratchet and Clank 3 multiplayer ran fine. As for the controller, it's a DualShock 2 analog controller, meaning unlike the GameCube controller, the joysticks rotate at full 360 degrees instead of just 8 directions. I personally love the controller, although the rubber cushioning of the joysticks I once wore out and it fell off, 
after an intense binge of Star Wars Battlefront 2, but the controller is great and a step up from the decent GameCube controller and the uncomfortable, bulky Xbox controller. As for games, this is where I'm going to talk about the many notable titles for the PlayStation 2 and bring in my friend Jay to talk about some of them. Jack and Daxter was a fun little collectathon that despite not doing a lot new with the genre and formula, was solid enough and it did offer one neat innovation, and that would be the no load time open world. While some games like Metroid Prime and Spyro hit their load times pretty well, you could tell when it was loading. With Jack, there was none whatsoever with the exception of a few cutscenes serving as low times like when going to the Misty Islands on boats. That cutscene is technically a low time, but for the most part, the whole open world is a no low time open world. Jack 2 and Jack 3 did have some low times, but their innovation was on how massive their worlds were, and there were rarely any dips in frame rate. well, except for the PlayStation Vita re-release, we don't talk about that. But those two games, they're really good PS2 games, and so is Jack 1 in its own right. I personally prefer Jack 2 and 3 over the first, but not everyone's going to agree with that. I've always felt that a game that has less innovation but more refined gameplay is better though, because a refined experience can be replayed forever, whereas an innovative one that is flawed can always be hard to love as much when looking back to it 10 to 20 years later in retrospect anyway, where like sequels really improve upon it, where it's just like a refined game will always be that forever. I know some people do prefer more innovative experience, but I don't know, I always have a more guaranteed good experience than one that tries to be something different and ages quite apparently, I guess. The Sly Cooper games were also great PlayStation trilogy, with the first one being a pretty linear platformer with the exception of choosing what level you want to start out with from the hub world. Although the two sequels ditched that in favor of more mission based levels in several open hub worlds and in my opinion was for the better. Not that the first one was bad or anything, I loved the first one, but Sly 2 and 3 was where it was at, and it really felt like an epic heist movie, which was assisted in part with the music in the background. Sly 1 is a fantastic game in my eyes, a fun story and characters with great simplistic gameplay, and Sly 2 is by far my favorite for its story and characters, and the innovations from the original. And of course, if you want more in-depth reviews of the Sly Cooper games, on my channel Jay's Reviews, I've got a 30 minute long analysis of Sly 2, and a review of Sly 1, which is much more general, but I'd hate to imagine how long the reviews of Sly 3 and Sly 4 will be. As for Ratchet and Clank, I only played the first three games and they got better with each installment. It is my favorite of the big three PS2 trilogies with its lovely visuals, hilarious storytelling, and very solid gameplay that still holds up to this day. I do like the first one, but the two sequels are where it's at when going Commando introduced RPG elements for the weapons and up your arsenal only improving that leveling up system for each weapon. It's often fan debate as to whether going Commando or up your arsenal are the best in the trilogy. I personally like Arsenal the most, but there are some people who prefer going to Commando, and I completely understand. Honestly, Ratchet and Clank is my least favorite of the three. I mean, it's a franchise that keeps on dragging on and on forever, scraping the bottom of the barrel for more ideas. I mean, that and other than Ratchet and Clank 2, 3, and Deadlocked, the humor is very overrated in these games. I mean, it's it's like, it's really bad how Into the Nexus humor was so stupid, stale, and repetitive and predictable. It just bothers me, I guess. It's just, Ratchet and Clank is just a series that just keeps on going on and on and on, doing the same things over and over and over again, or really just having gimmicks every single time just to make it seem a little bit different, and then people treat that as genuine innovation even though it's not. However, I will say Ratchet and Clank 2, 3, Deadlocked, and the future series consisting of Tools of Destruction, Quest for Booty, and A Crack in Time are all very great games. For me, my favorite would have to be Going Commando. I love the RPG level up system and all that stuff. It's just a very fun game to play. The GTA games and Shadow of the Colossus, I wish I could talk more about, but I honestly haven't played enough of those games to comment other than the grand scope of the world really shows how powerful the PS2 really was, and the open worlds, they're still pretty impressive to this day. 
Although, I did play a lot of Spider-Man 2, which was an open-world sandbox game, and I loved it so much as a kid. That was probably my most played PS2 game, although far from the best game on the PS2, to be honest, as its visuals and combat are very dated by today's standards. Although web-slinging is still fun, I think you'd be better off with Spider-Man Web of Shadows for the 7th generation consoles if you're to experience a Spider-Man game because you kind of had to be a 6th generation kid in order to get full enjoyment out of Spider-Man 2. Star Wars Battlefront 2 was my childhood. Sure, it was a multi-platform release, but it was probably the reason why it became such a Sony pony when I was an early teen. Yes, the visuals are kind of dated, but the multiplayer is still fun. My sister and I used to play that game for hours to the point where the disc is scratched beyond resale quality. I also did play quite a bit of Call of Duty before it suffered tremendous franchise fatigue. World at War and Beyond. Don't you mean children's online daycare? Whoa! <laughs> Call of Duty Finest Hour is not one I go back to often as, even on easy, there are major difficulty spikes like protecting a factory from Panzer Shrek wielding Nazis. If you're to play one game in a series, get Call of Duty 2. I really can't comment on the multiplayer of those games because I bought the trilogy in 2012 and by then the servers were down. But the single player campaign, it's still good. God of War, good hack and slash game, but I really don't like Kratos as I find him extremely unlikable. It's not a bad game, no, in fact, it's a great game. I just can't get past the unlikable Greek god killer and with the 6th generation game, the main character is kind of the selling point of a game. If you don't like playing as him, you probably won't pl like playing this game. I do like Devil May Cry, however. That is my preferred hack and slash game on the PS2, although I believe that's a multi-platform release, so does that count? Eh, sure, why not? Most people got it on PlayStation 2 anyways. Now while the PlayStation 2 released so many great new IPs, this console was also where the old PS1 IPs went to die. Crash Bandicoot, Wrath of Cortex, and Crash Twin Sanity are kind of like the Sonic Adventure games where fans are divided as to whether they like it or dislike it. Wrath of Cortex, I am not a huge fan of. I do think it's an okay game overall, but there are so many technical issues like very long 45 second load times, regressive controls where it's hard to predict where you're landing when jumping, some of the gameplay vehicle segments, while I do like some of them and think some of them are even better than Crash Bandicoot 3's vehicle segments, the underwater levels take forever and there are way too many unpredictable stage hazards. And don't get me started on the mech sections. If you're getting Wrath of Cortex, get the Xbox version as 45 second load times are now 15 seconds long. Crash Twin Sanity was fine, although by far the hardest Crash game I've ever played. Sometimes hard for the wrong reasons. I do think the graphics are good and the gameplay is solid, but as someone who's replayed this game like 9 times, I remember hit detection issues where occasionally Crash would die from an unseen projectile. And the physics are very wonky, especially for some of the puzzles. It's a pretty decent game, but I only played it for the hilarious story, as it has some of the best writing in the series. As for gameplay, it's okay. The PS2 Spyro games, I haven't played a lot of, honestly, but I wasn't really impressed by them. Enter the Dragonfly is said to be a broken mess, while a Hero's Tale was said to be a decent to good game. It depends on who you ask, but don't ask me. I just think they're meh. And Mega Man X, oh boy. Jay, you have all the honors. Firstly, for whatever reason, the Mega Man X collection can't be recorded via components, so I was stuck with composite and it looks pretty awful. But overall, the collection is a great way to go through the first six X games. That is, if you don't mind playing the PSX version of Mega Man X3 as opposed to the SNES original. I'm fine with both, honestly. I mean, X1 is my favorite, but any version of X3 is my second favorite. X4 being third, and X5 and X2, while being solid titles, aren't as good as mine, in my opinion. X2 because the game is very bland to me, and X5 because of the backtracking. And X6... is trash. Anyway. The PS2 saw exclusive release of Mega Man X8 and X7. Mega Man X7 for me is pretty underrated. I, I think the game is bad. D don't get me wrong. I can't say I find it any worse than X6, Extreme, Extreme 2, X Command Mission, and X8. Which to me is very overrated. 
I thought the game had poor level design, bosses, and weapons, making X8 not a fun game to play for me. While I do think X8 is at least a decent game, I do agree with most of what Jay said. And Kingdom Hearts, what can I say? Who would have thought that Square Enix and Disney IPs coming together in one massive convoluted universe would be so much fun to play through, so much fun to experience? Kingdom Hearts 1 was great, but Kingdom Hearts 2 I enjoyed even more. And while they do have their flaws, I recommend giving them a playthrough. You won't regret buying these games for your PS2, although at this point, why not just get them on the HD collections for PS3? War of the Monsters, I've reviewed that, and I really like that game. I think it's a pretty underrated monster fighting 3D arena based game that you should definitely give a shot. Maybe even a download if it's still available on the PlayStation Network. The Story All Humans 2, it's an open world sandbox game that takes place in the 1960s and you play as an alien invader who disguises himself as humans just so he can exist in their society and then, well, steal their brains or something to that effect. All I know is that they have to get their DNA in order to make their species live on. So you're not exactly playing as a hero in this game, <laughs> no you're not. And I think it's good for what it is. I don't think it's aged that well, to be perfectly honest, and it's not a game I go back to often. Although my good friend Justin Teeter is a big fan of the Destroy All Humans games, and I'm pretty sure there's many other Destroy All Humans fans out there. Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3, those are some of my favorite games on the PlayStation 2. Although there are the HD collections and the Legacy collection that have the games upscaled in HD as well as touch up on the textures and all that, but for PlayStation 2 games, they still hold up pretty well. In fact, Metal Gear Solid 3 can pass off as an early Xbox game, it looks that good. And I'll be perfectly honest, I like Metal Gear Solid 2 more than the first. Not that the first was bad or anything, I love the first one, but I don't know, I think that Metal Gear Solid 2 gets a little too much hate. I mean, it's not that it doesn't deserve the hate because of false marketing tactics making you think you play as Solid Snake when you're really playing as Raiden the whole game. But I thought it was pretty good and improved the combat system and the stealth mechanics, and Metal Gear Solid 3 just improved upon what Metal Gear Solid 2 established. Except they got rid of the Salton Raider, but eh, that's okay. At least you're not in that top-down view anymore if you get the substance version. The games I played as a kid are not exactly high-quality games. Well... Bionicle Heroes was actually the first game I played for the PS2 because I was really into Legos as a kid and I was into video games as a kid, so had the two merge and... That was okay in retrospect. I know I'm going to say that for a lot of these games, but I don't think it's bad, but I don't think it's great either. But it was enough for me to get excited about it on Christmas. Jimmy Neutron Attack of the Twonkies. This correlated with that very big episode of Jimmy Neutron from Season 2, if I'm not mistaken. It is a Luigi's Mansion clone, to say the least, except it's a lot more linear than Luigi's Mansion, and... It's okay, that's all I really gotta say about that. And Shrek the Third. The movie license game I played quite a bit as a kid, and it's not that good. From bland combat, boring visuals, and the plot that was used from the movie, which wasn't good to begin with. I just did not like this game. But Madagascar? That was actually a pretty good game. It's a pretty straightforward 3D platformer where you go from point A to point B. And there are a lot of fun mini games I remember spending a lot of hours on. Maybe it's objectively decent, but I don't know, I remember having a lot of fun with it as a kid. And that's the PS2. Even if you never grew up with the PS2, I still think it has an extensive library of games. In fact, I'm still collecting for the PS2 to this day. Its library is that vast. And I probably forgot to talk about a lot of major titles for it as well. I personally think it's one of the best consoles of all time, and it is my second favorite console, losing only to the Super Nintendo, but not by much. 
but I do know many people who consider it to be their favorite console of all time, and they have every right to believe that. I also feel as if the PS2 is one of the best consoles ever released, with, as you said, a great library and tons of lasting appeal, which is why definitely it's my favorite console of all time. And one major selling point is that it can play PS1 games. Yes, remember when consoles were backwards compatible? That's how I played the majority of my PS1 library, although you'll need a PS1 memory card as the PS2 memory card is not compatible to save PS1 games for some reason. I don't know why, but oh well. I got a third party PS1 memory card that had the power of four PS1 memory cards. And overall, I would give this console the excellent rating. I highly recommend you buy one used, preferably the fat model, although I don't think you'll lose any sleep getting a slim model. Just be careful with it when binging a certain video game. Wait, aren't you going to do another plug as part of our agreement? Mr. J of J's Reviews. That's not my name. Is an aspiring YouTube reviewer who has not one, but two good... Masterfully crafted. Okay, two masterfully crafted YouTube channels, one called Jay's Reviews where he reviews video games and does occasional rants. I highly recommend his Sly 2 review and his Mighty Number no. 9 rant. What about my Sly 1 review? Quiet, you. I also recommend watching his Let's Play channel. He has a very solid Mega Man Classic Series LP. Check out the current one, Mega Man 4. Of course you recommend the LP you and Exo Paradigm Gamer guest starred in. And his Sonic Game Gear LP, which I do not appear in. <laughs> Seriously, check out those channels. And as for this video, time for an abrupt conclusion. And with that said, this has been Jay of Jay's Reviews and Jay's Let's Plays, signing out.